Buongiorno, good morning everybody. Um, my name is Bruno Siciliano. I remember one of the first times when I was a PhD student. I did uh, the first cycle of the PhD in our university system. And uh, so I was uh, uh, starting to uh, travel and go into summer schools and workshops and events because I wanted to travel the world and I wanted to meet, uh, uh, to meet people and other researchers. And uh, so it's like people were assuming that because of my surname, Siciliano, I would come from, uh, from, from Sicily, of course. And, uh, and then I had to explain that uh, eventually there is some kind of um, uh, going back through the um, uh, family tree, someone must have come from, from, from Sicily to have this, uh, this surname. So, and the people were amused to have like a Neapolitan coming from, uh, from Sicily with all the stereotypes about uh, southern Italy that, uh, you know, we don't, uh, probably you heard some in the, in, in the sequence in the, in, the, in the TEDx talk that uh, because of the climate, because of the openness of the people. Uh, I mean, just like people from uh, at this latitude uh, work less than people at, uh, <laughs> at other latitudes. So w when, I, when I decided that when I was following my passion, my second passion, robotics, uh, uh, I, was, uh, I had to overcome a number of, uh, uh, I, I wouldn't call them drawbacks because I'm kind of always optimistic person, but kind of stereotypes that, uh, uh, I mean, just you can't, uh, you can't really compete at the forefront of uh, research and technology uh, if you live at this latitude. Uh, so I, th I think this is, I mean, we have a, a wonderful example here. Uh, Giovanni, Giovanni Muscato is my colleague and good friend in control and robotics. Uh, but uh, I mean, I dare to say that uh, um, we, uh, we've been doing quite, um, a lot of uh, work uh, together with my team. This is the PRISMA team. Uh, PRISMA stands for Projects of Robotics for Industry, Services, Mechatronics and Automation. And uh, it's a team that uh, uh, was originally formed by my mentor to robotics, uh, is Professor Lorenzo Shavico, who is now retired since, uh, uh, since a few years. And I was his uh, first PhD student. And uh, so, we made quite uh, an international team during this year, thanks to the, to the funding, of course. They knew that uh, today I was coming to a lecture here, so they're just uh, doing a sort of hola, so they're, they're greeting you. And this is the current lineup of the team. Uh, so besides myself, is Luigi Villani, who is a, now, he was my first PhD student, he's now a full professor since last year. Vincenzo Lipiello is uh, an associate professor. Alberto Finzi and Silvia Rossi, they are more from the computer science than engineering. And also they work with us in our department. Fabio Ruggero is an assistant professor. And the next line is the line of the, I would call them the Italian postdocs. Uh, Fanny soon should be an assistant professor as well. And then I've had a number of um, postdocs from, from abroad, as I was uh, telling in the, in the TEDx talk. Oh, I only have two, Alejandro Gils and Yun Tai Kim uh, from Mexico and Korea, but in the past we had uh, uh, people from Japan, from, uh, from Argentina, from Australia, from France, from Al Algeria. So uh, it's, it's really nice to have an international, international team. Uh, Andrea Fontanelli, Mario Selvaggio and Fabio Vigoriti are our, our, our current PhD students. Valeria, she's my uh, assistant. Jonathan is the uh, project manager for all the European projects. So this is the Prisma team. Recently, about uh, two years ago, we formed, uh, we launched uh, an interdepartmental center for advances uh, in robotic surgery. This is the uh, ICAROS center, which I direct at, uh, so this is a joint uh, venture between uh, the College of Medicine and the College of Engineering at uh, University of Naples, uh, Federico II. And those are the main uh, uh, surgeons working with us that uh, led us to establishing this, uh, this center. Uh, since I will be speaking about advances in robotic surgery, uh, I will just go into the details of the Icaro Center, what we're doing in, in the minute. So I want to follow with the presentation and just tell you about uh, what I call our research portfolio. So this is the merely ordered alphabetical list of research topics 
which, uh, on which we are currently active. So, uh, I mean, th there are some kind of uh, classical topics, like, for instance, uh, when I did my PhD thesis back in uh, 1986, I was working on inverse kinematics and redundant manipulators, which is a kind of classical topic that you can find also in robotics textbooks, uh, and then lightweight flexible arms when I spent a year at Georgia Tech in, uh, in, in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, and then um, what, I, what I want to say is that, uh, you know, we are control guys. And I remember when I started doing research, when I, want, I wanted to do research in robotics, uh, we were working more at the servo level. So we were basically, like my mentor, Professor Shavico, and uh, the colleagues of time were working on adaptive, robust control of uh, nonlinear systems, and robot manipulators were an excellent uh, case study to apply some of the adaptive robust control techniques. So what I want to say is that uh, we grew up according to a bottom-up approach. So I started working on, uh, let's say, control of uh, electromechanical systems like robot manipulators. And then with my PhD thesis, I moved from the joint level to the task level and dealing with uh, inverse kinematics, redundant manipulators, how you want to transform the motion from the end effect of robot manipulator to the joints. And then little by little, we started working on, uh, on just uh, uh, controlling robots interacting with the environment. So we, we dealt with uh, force control, like controlling the interaction and the contact between the robot manipulators and the surface, and then with visual control, and then we uh, applied our theories to a number of uh, application scenarios. Uh, and, and then, you know, for instance, like aerial robotics. For instance, I knew nothing about unmanned aerial systems, which was not part of, uh, of our scientific domain in control in, in robotics. And, but unmanned aerial systems had been around for many years. The novelty since, uh, I would say, seven, eight years from now, was that uh, with, uh, with flying uh, drones, with flying, uh, uh, they call them multicopters, could be like quadcopters, hexacopters, and so forth, there is a possibility not only to have a sort of flying eye to inspect and to surveil, to patrol an area, but also the possibility to have some light arms and to do aerial manipulation. And so since then, you know, we got interested in the last seven, eight years about, uh, about aerial robotics. So assistive robotics is another area of research. And then, of course, robotic surgery technology, service robotics, and so forth. So you know, we really grew up. And from the several level, from the control of the motors of the robot, now most of our work is about, uh, in one word, like uh, robots cooperating with humans, human-robot interaction. So robots operating in less structured environment where you have to deal with all the uncertainty and the uh, structure features of the environment, and you want to exploit the information coming from uh, the extraceptive sensors, from the external sensors like uh, proximity sensors, lasers, leaders, and all kinds of sensors, GPS if you are outdoors, and so forth. And you want to integrate all this. So most of the attention in robotics now is how to make a, a robotic system to behave, I could say autonomously, or maybe I should say semi-autonomously, and be able to interact with the world, with the environment, in an intelligent way. I'll be going th um, uh, through this kind of issues at the end of my, of my lecture today, when I will expand the interest from uh, surgical robotics, which is the topic of the lecture, to other uh, challenging applications. Uh, if we if you go to our website and you look at the list of uh, our publications, this is a, a, a word cloud which was done with the words which have been used in the titles of the papers we published. So you can get an idea of, uh, and the, the, the bigger words are those that happen, occur more frequently in the titles of papers. So these are all kind of subjects that uh, we've been, uh, we've been uh, uh, working on. So, I mean, classical, uh, uh, say mechanical and control subject, but also some application like, uh, for instance, I don't know, like uh, a B manual, like synergies, like also words coming from other domains of uh, which are even beyond the boundaries of engineering and technology. Of course, financial support 
is important. And uh, we've been quite, uh, well, I shouldn't say lucky, probably we've been quite good <laughs> in raising money for doing research and for ex expanding the team and competing with the top teams, not only at the national level, but also at an international level. Uh, this is the cloud of the logos of the projects that uh, have been funded in the last uh, eight years from uh, the six framework program through Horizon 2020, which is the, uh, the current eight, if you wish, is the eight framework program by the European uh, Union. Just, I don't have time to go into the details of the project. Just want to say that, uh, you know, there were some uh, networking projects which were very important to establish a community. And uh, I'm speaking about Euron. Euron is European Robotics Research Network, which was started, uh, I believe, in uh, 2000, even, even in framework program five, I believe. And then, oh, Ethic Box was a very nice project which was uh, coordinated by Guglielmo Tamburini, who was a speaker in this school, uh, I believe, on, on Tuesday. And uh, he has been one of the, I would say, pioneers in the field, together with others like Gianmarco Verugio and Fiorello Aperto, who was here this after, uh, yesterday afternoon about uh, roboethics. Uh, and then there were projects like uh, Eurobotics and uh, ROCQ Rock and ROCQ2. And those were either network of excellence or now they're called coordination and support action. So there's not much of research carried out within these projects, but basically, you know, it's an opportunity to work as a network with other labs and also to organize exchange of students, like some schools, like, like this one, and so forth. So this, 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 these have been quite instrumental in establishing a community. And also, I, I want to stress that uh, uh, currently, we have the so-called European Robotics Association, which is based in Brussels. The affiliation is not on a personal level, like, for instance, IEEE, that you can be you as a, as a person, a member of IEEE. The affiliation is at the institutional level. So it's more similar to, for instance, IFAC. IFAC is International Federation of My Control, where you, know, just you can be as, as an institution to be, uh, to be a member. And, um, so the European Robotics Association gathers more than 230 members across Europe. And it's, it's important to stress that uh, it's not only academic institutions and research institutions, but also all the, big, all the big players, all the stakeholders, like big companies like KUKA, ABB, Comau, and so forth, and also the small and medium enterprises, including several startups of doing robotics in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Europe. So th this has been, and I'm currently serving as a member of the board of directors of the of EU Robotics Association. And then a number of research projects. Uh, the first one was Friends Project. And I think the logo speaks by himself, by itself, because it's, it's a project uh, addressing the issue of physical human-robot interaction in which we were trying to address safety and, and dependability in interaction. If one day we want to have robots in our homes, they have to be safe and they have to be dependable, and I want to add, they also have to be acceptable by the users, by the, by the humans. So this is a very important issue. Uh, the first project I coordinated, the first uh, big project, the trade project was Dexmart, which ran from 2008 to 2012, and it's about B-manual manipulation. So we were dealing with uh, dual arm and dual hand systems, uh, usually like prehensile, grasps, it's like, you know, just with the multi-finger hands. There was also uh, a new uh, uh, hand prototype that uh, we developed together with our colleagues from University of Bologna and also with the Seconda Università di Napoli, near Napoli, which is now called Università della Campania Luigi Van Vitelli. It was a new Dexma hand which was developed. And uh, one of the most successful startups which is called Artiminds. They're based in Karlsruhe. This startup was, uh, uh, was uh, um, a sort of result, an output of the Dexmart project in the group of uh, um, uh, Rudiger Dillmann at uh, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in, in Germany. 
and uh, the Safari project was uh, the natural follow-up to the Friends project in which we were dealing not only with the physical human-robot interaction but also with the cognitive aspects of human-robot interaction. And then, as I say, a number of projects on higher robotics, the first one being the Higher Robots project in which we were trying to let's say, teleoperate a drone, a quadcopter, through an optical interface, also with, with a small arm to do some kind of manipulation. Uh, and the coordinator is also an Italian colleague, he's uh, speaking about Lorenzo Marconi at the uh, University of uh, Bologna. And then we had the Arcas project, in which it was aerial robotic cooperative assembly systems. So it's like two drones with two arms and hands, you know, doing some kind of assembly you know, in a coordinated fashion. If you go to, uh, to our website, uh, www.prisma.unina.it, uh, on the bottom right, there's a button to the YouTube channel. And we have a YouTube channel where you can find more than 100 videos about research, which is very much related to those projects. And this is the case, you will find some very really nice video uh, within iRobot Arcas and Sherpa, which was a project which ended the last year, also coordinated by Lorenzo Marconi in Bologna. And the main issue was to have uh, some search and rescue robots. So it was a kind of hybrid system, which was uh, a support to the Sherpa, to the mountain guides up in the Alps. So Club Alpino Italiano was also one partner in this project. And the idea was to have uh, an hybrid solution in which there was some kind of uh, fixed air, uh, fixed wing uh, uh, aircraft patrolling some area. And then there were some mini helicopters and some, some drones. And the idea was uh, once the victim of an avalanche was, uh, was, uh, was identified, of course, assuming that the, that the victim was wearing uh, the proper sensor, you know, to be, then, uh, you know, there was uh, uh, a donkey, which all the instrumentation for the Sherpa, and because, he, as you know, a victim of avalanche has, uh, can survive uh, no more than 30, 40 minutes under the avalanche. So time is an issue, and you have to localize the victim uh, fast, and also you have to rescue and try to free from, uh, from the, from the, uh, from the tones of, uh, of, of snow. So this was the Sherpa project. And then Ario Arms is also another project uh, which is undergoing within Horizon 2020 about, um, about uh, uh, also uh, aerial technology and manipulation. And then uh, there were two projects. One was Accord. Accord uh, was a very set sort of milestone into the funding system at the European level because Accord was a project whose main goal was to facilitate the transfer of technology from the research labs to the small medium enterprises and to the robotics companies. So what we achieved in Accord was to fund, to finance 51 small groups developing some experiments using uh, some sort of standard robotic equipment as provided by the robot manufacturers. And uh, this was uh, also, as I say, the milestone because uh, uh, in ECHO there were a number of small and medium enterprises involved because we were able to lower the barriers because you have to consider that competition for European funding is very, very high. Like the last call, the last call which was in April, um, there was a budget for research and innovation actions, so it's like research projects, of 15 million. And there were 84 proposals submitted. I was, also, I was involved with my team in five of them, and uh, only four were funded. So, I mean, so it's 5%. Fi and when these projects were, uh, you know, were successful, the acceptance rate was around, I would say, 9, 10%. So it's very, and a small and medium enterprise cannot afford the luxury of uh, investing two person months into the preparation of proposal whose uh, probability of success is between 5 and 10%. We in academia, we can afford because, you know, we, we that's what we like. That's what we do, actually. I mean, that's what I spend most of my time, you know, as, as a research manager now, maybe less involved into, uh, into the uh, nitty-gritty daily business of working in the lab and just cranking up things and, 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 and so forth. So, I mean, we've been successful with a new project which we start in January. This is High Flyers. So it's yet another project using some sort of hybrid technology like a drone that is supposed to do some kind of, ins some kind of inspection on pipelines and then the drone can land, can clump 
on, on the pipes, and then there will be some sort of crawling, like snake-like, you know, just to, to carry on. So it's kind of hybrid, uh, you know, flying and ground technology that we will develop. It's not yet there because it's not yet, uh, you know, we are now signing the, the grant. So this was like a number of projects on uh, aerobotics. And uh, at the beginning of this, of this week, from Monday until Wednesday, I was in Köln, in Cologne. In, in Germany, and we had a meeting for the Refills project. Refills is a, is, a, is a project on a very important and emerging area of application for robotics, and this is the area of logistics. So Refills is a project about having a robotic assistant for supermarkets in refilling the shelves, the products in the shelves. And the partners in this project, uh, besides uh, ourselves and Università della Campania Luigi Van Vitelli, there are, there are KUKA, who is the biggest robot manufacturer. There's a Swisslog, which is like the European Amazon. It's a logistic company, which is a member of the KUKA group since a year and a half. And then there is a DM. For those of you that come from Germany or from, like, or from, the, uh, from the Northern East Europe, DM is a big uh, uh, supermarket uh, uh, chain. And also they have all the bio, the youngsters, they like shopping at BM because they have all the kind of bio products. So it's, it's, it's a big, so we were in one, in the, in the national distribution center in Cologne by DM. And I was really fascinated to see the facility and, uh, and all the problems that, uh, that they have in, in just uh, uh, preparing the pallets or the boxes to be shipped to the regional distribution center and then to the stores. And the idea of refills is to have this kind of robotic assistant uh, to the clerks working in, in the supermarket. Then um, EUROC is another project which I, co I coordinate, which will end in June of next year. And uh, it's, uh, there's been a lot of attention in the media, probably you heard, or you read about that, about the DARPA challenges. You know, the first DARPA challenge was uh, the grand challenge back in, uh, I believe in 2005, in which uh, some vehicles uh, succeeded in, uh, uh, in, in uh, making a path of about 160 miles in the, in, in the desert autonomously without being teleported. And then it was the urban challenge in 2007. And there's been also uh, the uh, other two challenges. Uh, the last one was, I think, two years ago, the robotic challenge with the humanoid that had to drive uh, a car and then to do some kind of servicing task into a sort of nuclear plant. You know, it's like, uh, that's fine because US, USA is also the country of competition and challenges. This is part of the education. I think in Europe, we have been doing less of, of this stuff. I think it's also part of, I think there are some kind of uh, social and cultural differences. Uh, but uh, challenges are a driver or a pusher of innovation. And so what we came up with the idea of launching a project, a program actually in Europe, and this is Europe, European Robotic Challenges, and this is undergoing right now. And it started uh, in January of 2014. And the idea were, was to have three challenge scenarios one on, um, let's say, it's a sort of a flexible manufacturing cell in which the issue was, is human-robot cooperation. This, the second one, the second challenge, is about logistics like mobile manipulation to have not only, let's say, an AGV, an automatic guided vehicle, but also possibility to have an arm over a mobile platform. And the third challenge is plant inspection and servicing using aerial technology. So the, there are some uh, platform hosts which are based uh, respectively at IPA Fraunhofer in Stuttgart, at the DLR in Oberpfaffenhofen and Wesseling near Munich, and the third one, the flying arena, is at ETH in Zurich, in the groups of uh, Roland Sigvart and Raffaello D'Andrea in Zurich. So, and th th there have been 15 teams competing, and now those teams have been reduced to six teams, and they get financial support from us. And, uh, and then, at the end of the game, we can say, in May, June of next year, there will also be a Euro winner, but the winner will only be symbolic, because, uh, I mean, uh, we, we can't do like uh, the Americans giving a monetary prize of two million you know, to the winner of the challenge because at the end of the day, this is uh, European taxpayers' money and so this cannot be given in prizes. So it's kind of symbolic because the teams have been supported from us you know, through the Europe project. 
Then the cherry of the, uh, on the cake came, uh, probably you heard in the TEDx talk with Rodiman. Rodiman uh, is an advanced grant, which was funny to me. I say to me and not to the team because it's the only type of grant which is personal. So all the European projects are grants going to the institution, and it's usually a consortium of, of, of uh, several partners. The grants by European Research Council are personal. So you get, you get it, so it's kind of a word. You get the grant, if I want to change the institution and come for the last year of Rodiman to University of Catania, I told to the rector, I make a deal, and I can transfer my money from Napoli to Catania if I wish so. And this has been also an instrument which has been used by some uh, European brains who had emigrated abroad, outside Europe, uh, like one guy was uh, Vincent Hayward, he was at McGill University in, uh, in Montreal in Canada, he's a French, and he used his advanced grant to go back to Sorbonne University, University Paris in, in, in Paris, because he was a rich man, because the grant is 2.5 million and for five years. So he was able to pay his own salary for a few years, and it's also prestigious that the host institution, you know, like if you go to the website of ETH in Zurich, they are proudly advertising that uh, in Framework Program 7, they got, I think, uh, like uh, 41 grants from European Research Council, which is a proof of excellence also for the institution and also for the, for the ranking. So Rodman came in 2013, and it's uh, running until next year. Probably I will uh, uh, extend this for by one year. Uh, this has been a lot of uh, coverage of the project in the media because as a demonstrator, Rodiman is about robotic dynamic manipulation. So by dynamic manipulation, what is meant, normally robots grasp objects uh, uh, like human hands in, in a kind of prehensile way like this. So basically you grasp and then you can lift the object. But actually, humans are also good at uh, performing other tasks without grasping. So for instance, uh, I can use uh, this stick to do some manipulation, and also some of the object, of the object might be elastic, might be deformable. And uh, so this, this is very much beyond the frontier, because I wouldn't say that the issue of prehensile manipulation is fully solved. Because if you go to industrial robots, most of the end effectors are simple jaws, like grippers. And the cost of an art, a multi-finger multi uh, anthropomorphic hands is also very, is still very high, and also they are very fragile and not as reliable as, 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 the, as the, the arms. So, but going very much beyond, because I mean, this, this research funded by European Research Council is a sort of blue sky research. So you really go beyond. And so we wanted to address this kind of very complicated problems of dynamic manipulation. And I remember that we were working until late against the deadline for submitting the proposal in the lab. And then I was with my students and then we were working until, until late and then we ordered a pizza. And, and then I had a sort of illumination. I mean, just this, this is it. You know, because if you look at the phases of the pizza chef, uh, in uh, just uh, stretching the dough, and then sometimes you know they do this kind of acrobatic tossing, and then seasoning is the easy part because seasoning is like manufacturing, and then baking. I mean, just like uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, Giovanni agrees with me that uh, this is an underactuated control problem because basically, by uh, you have uh, a real oven, not an electric oven, a wooden oven, and then what you have to do, the pizzaiolo chef does two motion like this. Uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, swivel motion, and then this other motion, and then by two inputs, you want to control three degrees of freedom, which is the position of the, of the pizza dough on the peel and the orientation. So it's two against three, and it's, it's a very nice control problem. So I say, okay, you know what? This will be also a great media expedient. Then, of course, you know, we also had, uh, like, uh, there, was, uh, there have been some kind of media waves because, I mean, the media have, of course, this is appealing because you know, it's, it's a kind of, of, uh, of uh, potential use of the robots, but I was always on the line that this was just a metaphor because never I will eat, you know, as an appointment, I will eat a pizza made by, by a robot chef. Also because uh, an, an appointment chef also puts his or her soul into making a pizza. But it's just a demonstration because everybody is, is able to understand the complexity and the dexterity and the agility which is required one day by a robotic system 
to prepare to for the very for the various phases of the pizza and then of course you know like uh, last june we were on the uh, scientific american there was an article and then it's like the times of london and then uh, of course you read article how come it's like you know just the uh, european union gave so much money to this guy who wants to make uh, a ro robot chef which is replace what the napolitans do at their best and it's just a metaphor. And actually, we are now applying some of the techniques, and I will be talking about this later into my lecture, uh, also in, in contexts like, for instance, surgical robotics, in which we have uh, tissues, muscles, and we have the issue of recognizing and also touching some kind of deformed objects. And one of my PhD students, Fabio Vigoriti, is working. Uh, uh, this is an industrial PhD, which was funded by the ministry uh, to, to some Italian universities last year, and is working with a company based in Vigevano. Vigevano, together with uh, Macerata, are the two towns in Italy. They are the, the homes, the clusters of the shoe industry. Shoe industry, and there there is a similar problem because of the skin of the leather of uh, sorry of the leather for, for, for preparing you know just for gluing the uh, the the leather to the uh, tomaya I, I don't know how you say like uh, you know just i don't know the technical words the technical vocabulary for the shoe so he's applying some of the rodman concept to the shoe industry because that's manipulation of the formal objects so this was the main purpose of doing this kind of blue sky research but of course the media they always want a story to write about so pizza making uh, by by robot is definitely a story and it's it's a way also to have uh, people speak about robotics and about uh, Napoli and, and, and our team. Then there were two other projects. Uh, one is uh, Musha. Musha is, uh, is a local funded project through some European funding. And it's the first project about uh, a three finger uh, mini hand, which is used uh, as a sort of device uh, for the Da Vinci uh, uh, robotic system for surgery. And Romolo is another project which is like uh, Refills is a project about logistics for hospitals so to have a sort of intelligent cart in the hospital, which can be safely operated by, you know, without really uh, colliding into objects or into other people in, in the in, in the hospital. So it's, it's another project. So all these projects brought together funding of nine million euro to our team in the last eight years, and that's quite a record for a team of uh, of this size, I believe. Um, you probably know this. This is the robotics, uh, the, the, what I call the textbook, and this is also very much part of my of my story because uh, I remember that when I was uh, uh, when I finished my PhD uh, back in 1986, uh, I was undecided what to do, and there was no position available. And I started, you know, working on the idea of uh, together with my mentor, Professor Shavico, to start a new course in robotics. And, uh, and so I start writing lecture notes. And the first year I taught robotics in Napoli was uh, in 1990. Uh, I, I just become a research associate, but I was tempted many times to leave since there was no position. And for three years I was, I was like a typical, uh, you know, parents' boy living home, without need, you know, just to have a salary to make money. And uh, so I was kind of tempted because I got opportunity to get positions basically in the U.S. But um, as I, you know, I resist this temptation for, for a number of reasons. Uh, if I have to confess, you know, the most important reason at that time was uh, a short guy <laughs> who, who was, um, was being the best player ever, football player. And that time, so in 1986, I came back from US, from Georgia Tech, and I got an offer as an assistant professor to go there and uh, the, the, the offer was, uh, I remember, this is uh, just, uh, I want to, in, in, one, in one, I gave a talk to some um, surgical conference um, last June, and this is, uh, Yeah, this is why. Well, okay.
This is my voice. So this is the why, you know, I, the real reason. <laughs> <laughs> but this has been one of probably the funniest thing I've done in my life. Uh, you know, I took part, I was, uh, I was myself in this movie, which was produced by Warner Bros. Last, uh, you know, this is a, it's a kind of documentary film. And uh, so they came to my lab and what they did, they select 20 Neapolitans from, uh, from the fish, uh, cellar in Pigna Seca, which is a no traditional district in Napoli, even to this uh, crazy guy in the, in the in robotics lab uh, in Napoli. But uh, so I had to make a choice. I had an offer to be an assistant professor at Georgia Tech in, in Atlanta with a starting sal with, a, with a tenure track and a starting salary of forty five thousand uh, dollars. Instead of this, I subscribed the season pass to the to Napoli. And I, I, I made the right choice because we won the first championship in our history. And what I've seen, you know, would be no comparison. Of course, there's been... <laughs> I mean, that's... Uh, life is a choice. Always. Okay, so this... this um, going back to the textbook, uh, it's, it's funny because uh, uh, I started writing lecture notes and I was... Uh, uh, a kind of uh, uh, presumptuous that uh, I could publish this as a textbook. Uh, and uh, I interacted with Magro Hill because Magro Hill is a publisher in Italy that they publish quite a few. I mean, our, the most adopted uh, control textbook is a textbook by colleagues from at Politecnico Milano, uh, Paolo Bolzer, Riccardo Scattolini, and Nicola Schiavoni is a control textbook in, uh, and it was published by, in Italian. And I wanted to publish in Italian and English, but uh, the publishers in Milan are now Italian. Italian professors don't don't speak good, don't don't write good English. You know, English is a crisp language, and then you have to be really, you know, you can, it's, it's too wordy, too verbose. The way you write uh, technical matters in Italian and things like this. And I think, it, you know, just uh, since I've been also working as a teaching assistant. Uh, in US, I think you know I could I could write a nice textbook, but they didn't have any trust in me. And then if I I'm a kind of uh, you know, of course I'm a passionate Napolitan, but I'm also a very focused and goal-oriented uh, German engineering <laughs> engineer. You know, just if I want to get something, I I I, I, I want to, to achieve it. So I sent the manuscript. I mean, this was before internet, before email. I sent the manuscript to the publisher in New York, Megger Hill. And uh, I got a contract, it was accepted. I had done something very smart. I circulated my lecture notes among a number of colleagues in US universities, so I allowed them to use the lecture notes as a teaching material. So most of the big names, big guys in the US, they were aware of, of this lecture notes. So reviews were positive, I got a contract. Then I went to the guys in Milano who had been kind of cheating me. I said, okay, what's the deal now? You want to translate this? And uh, I, I was, uh, able to get paid for the translation from English into Italian. It was not for the money, but it was for the principle that they had no trust into this, uh, you know, just Southern Italian author. So the book has been translated uh, as one of the most widely adopted textbooks. And also, you know, having refused some uh, uh, faculty positions at Georgia Tech, I was close to a faculty position at Stanford as well later in 89. So this is a textbook which is uh, as a textbook in all those universities. It's also been translated in Greek and uh, Chinese. Um, I have uh, three children, uh, two boys and a girl, but in a way I have a fourth child. And the fourth child is not this guy, because this guy is uh, Usama Khatib, probably you recognize, if you know him at Stanford University, is, uh, uh, is perhaps, for me, is the brightest mind we have in, uh, in, in robotics. Uh, and uh, the fourth child is what I, what I say is the handbook because I devoted 12 years of my life to the handbook. Uh, and this was from 2002 to 2008 for the first edition, and then it was from 2010 to 2016 for the second edition. 
And uh, this is quite funny because uh, this picture was taken, uh, ICRA is our flagship conference, it's the IEEE International Conference of Robotics Automation, and in 2010 it was in Anchorage in Alaska. And uh, the last day we drove from Anchorage north to Talkitna and we took an aircraft together with the other eight guys uh, to fly over the Denali National Park. McKinley is the highest peak in, in North America. In, in the American continent. And so we had like this, and this is the aircraft of Talkitan Airways. And since both Usama and myself, we had been received, we had received some awards at this conference, uh, we sent this picture to, to the Springer people and they had a kind of press release. You know, the two editors uh, are here and they photoshopped Talkitan Airways. I mean, by, by chance, by chance, the colors of the aircraft were exactly the colors. This is serendipity. The red and the blue of the handbook of the Springer corporate colors. And so what they do, what they did, they, they Photoshop this and as if, you know, with the rich, the, the rich wealthy editors, they had their own <laughs> aircraft, you know, to fly over the Denali. And I have a short video which uh, really tells you in two minutes and 20 seconds what, why the handbook has been very much absorbing our lives, you know, like uh, my, myself, Usama, and more recently, Thorsten Kroger, who has been involved in the second edition as a multimedia editor. So this was the, la the launch of the handbook in uh, Daijon at IROS conference uh, last year in, uh, in Korea, last fall. And as you've noticed, there's a, a new technology, which has been the first book which has been published in this technology. It's kind of augmented reality. So basically, in fact, uh, I was resisting. To, I wanted to be a free man. So I only have a smartphone since last October. And I was proud not to be the owner of a smartphone because I think this is ruining uh, our lives in many ways. Of course, you know, it's, it's a nice, it's like, well, maybe, I mean, that's, that's a, long, a long discussion. But now that we have the app for the, <laughs> I must, I also have a, a smartphone. Like my second son gave me his old one, you know, to the old father. And it, because of course the kids, they must have the latest, you know, the most advanced model. But it's nice because uh, as you see, there are some icons of the video. Together with the handbook, we launched the portal. The portal is handbookofrobotics.org. And there is a data bank of the 700 
700 videos that we collected and also it's being uh, extended even beyond the publication of the, of the handbook because people can contribute additional videos. So for the, from the handbook, you see the app recognizes this icon and then you can play the video while you read, you read the handbook. So it's, it's very nice and also uh, if you go to the, to the handbook of robotics website, there is also, uh, I was invited as a, a speaker at the Springer uh, one, one Springer Nature Conference, which is an annual event, because Springer now is, uh, is, is together with Nature. Nature is the publisher, it's Macmillan, the publisher of Nature magazine. And I'll tell you something more later about uh, what is my fifth child, which I'm trying to incubate, you know, in, in a sense. So it's, um, uh, so now th this, this big conference, it's every year in Barcelona, and I was a sort of uh, the keynote speaker and uh, I gave a presentation about uh, robotics, uh, pretty much like the TEDx talk. And also, if you go to the handbook uh, uh, portal, there is a very nice interview that I did with uh, TV in which like eight minutes I speak about what is the handbook, you know, what we did, what we achieved. And uh, now this technology is becoming very, very appealing within Spring and also other publishers because it's, it's really, it's really the, the new thing, the possibility. And actually when we send papers to journals now, typically they accept uh, video footage, like clippings, because I mean, especially in sp experiments, you have to show what, 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 what it works and what it doesn't work in, in the lab when you're working on something uh, advanced. Okay, so this is, works as a sort of introduction, just g get an idea of uh, who I am, what, what we did, and, uh, and uh, what, is the being, what, are the, what, what have been the, the passion drivers of this long story in robotics. So uh, this was, I believe, uh, uh, a year and a half ago, in which the minister and the uh, governor of, uh, of uh, Campania region came uh, to inaugurate the, the new Center for Advances in Robotic, in robotic Surgery at the University of Napoli. Together, uh, currently there are five departments which are part of this center. The founding ones was, was being my department, Department of E and IT, together with the Department of Neurosciences, uh, blah, 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 and then the Department of Public Health, and then recently we, we had both the Department of Physics and the Department of Industrial Engineering joining this center. Uh, the, the, the thing you see here, that's the clinical Da Vinci, which is the only F FDA certified system used for, uh, typically for minimally invasive uh, robotic surgery. But uh, besides this, we have uh, uh, another platform, which is called Da Vinci Research Kit. And this is uh, a previous generation Da Vinci. So from the black, from the black arms there, you see it's, it's the old one, it's the old Da Vinci. But for us, it's very nice, it's very important, because it's an open platform. So we have some control boards, and we can, uh, we can open, we can dismantle, so we can, we can carry out research. And in Truly Surgical, which is the manufacturer of Da Vinci, they started the community, so they donated these platforms to 28 uh, pilot labs around the world. In Italy, there are four of them. Uh, the first one who got was Arianna Menciassi at the Scuola Sant'Anna in Pisa, then is Paolo Fiorini at Universidad Verona, then ourselves two years ago, and recently Elena De Momi at Politecnico di Milano, biomedical uh, engineering uh, professor. So um, it's nice. It's a console with uh, two master tool manipulators. Each, uh, each manipulator has eight degrees of freedom. Uh, and then there is a patient side console with the two patient side manipulators, which are controlled by the master one with the coordinated foot, foot pedal movements. And also we have this kind of interface and we have a community. So for instance, uh, next week we have the uh, CRAS workshop in Montpellier in France, a computer robot assisted surgery workshop. And there is a meeting of all the European users of the Da Vinci. There are uh, now nine labs in Europe using this, uh, this platform, four of which, as I said, uh, in Italy. The other ones are uh, three in uh, UK, there is uh, UC, uh, University College London, Imperial, of course, and University of Leeds. And then there is uh, uh, another one at Obuda University in, in, uh, in Budapest in Hungary. So, uh, and uh, in two weeks from now at the IROS conference, there is a kind of world meeting, you know, just with all the uh, uh, representatives of these uh, 28 labs. Uh, and the nice thing they do, you know, they just make all this material open. Because it is true that uh, Intuitive has got uh, 
most, if not all, the patents in the field, but they are very well aware that other, other teams, uh, I'm speaking both about uh, research labs, startups, and even big companies, because Google is also investing in this, are developing some systems that sooner or later will be certified. So intuitive as a kind of open the community, and for instance now, in, in the DVRK community, there are also the users of Raven. Raven is another robotic platform which is not yet certified and was developed by the group of Blake Hannaford at the University of Washington in Seattle. So, I mean, because they know, they know that, uh, I mean, this, this, the, 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 the world is changing. For instance, uh, there's been uh, some European technology, very fine technology, developed at DLR in Germany, and this is called Miro, Miro Surge. This was the outcome of several projects, and I was surprised. I mean, just in a way, European economy is suffering, and even a big country like Germany cannot really contract the, the flow, the big flow of capitals and money. Because I give you two examples. This technology by DLR, they sold the patent to a company which belonged to the Google, to the Google X. So the money came from the West. Not far from Munich, for five, 50 minutes drive is KUKA, based in Augsburg. KUKA is now part of Midea. Midea is a Chinese company. So it's another case in which the capital, you know, the capital money comes from the, from the East. So, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's the way things are. And, uh, and uh, in both cases, they were, you know, Germany is, is a great country, and it's like, you know, with a strong economy, and, and they were not able to really, you know, just, you know, stop this kind of flow of capitals to the west or to the east, and they were able to keep you know, the technology and, and the patents you know, in, the, in, uh, in Europe, I would say. Anyway, but this is another story. So let me go into the details of, uh, of the lecture. And uh, I mean, having been a professor now for too long, I like to classify, to cluster. You know, just, I think it's good because uh, it's, uh, you know, it gives a clear idea of what surgical robotics is and what what, what is not, in a way. So, when we speak about medical robotics, uh, I think we have three main areas. I mean, this is in my opinion. One is surgical robotics, in which we use robotic tools to improve the quality of intervention in terms of accuracy, reduce the invasiveness, and predict predictability of results. Then we also have another big area of interest, which is rehab robotics. And rehab robotics, we use robots and machines to improve the quality of life of both impaired and elderly people, mainly through increased personal independence. And also we can use robots for motor therapy, you know, like for instance, uh, exoskeletons and so forth. Then we have another area, which in my opinion also belongs to medical robotics. And well, of course, you know, maybe people in biorobotic thing is not, is not really medical robotics, but it, it has a really tight link with medical robotics. And this is biorobotics is the area of, uh, it's kind of uh, human or uh, uh, anthropomorphic and zoomorphic inspired design of robots, you know, to, and there are also some kind of uh, cultural difference. For instance, if you go to Wikipedia, you find out that most of the robot photos, pictures, are for ja from Japanese robots. Now, this is not corresponding to reality because, of course, Japanese have been kind of uh, innovators into robotics, but uh, why is that? Because of the, of the appearance of the robot. And that's part of the culture society. Because uh, Sintoism, religion, which is the dominant religion in Japan, they believe that machines have a soul. And uh, the machines, to be accepted by humans, they have to look like humans or human pets or animals. So that's why they are so obsessively developing robots to look like humans and uh, or, or animals. But also, I mean, there is a good use of this technology because if we take, for instance, uh, Paro, the, you know, the fluffy robot seal, the robot, the robot seal puppet, that was originally developed by Takanori Shibata at Advanced Institute of Science and Technology in Tsukuba to entertain the elderly people in those um, uh, ho hospice for, because again, the Japanese society, you know, just the, in Italy, the oldest live with the, you know, just the, the grandfather, the grandparents live with the, with the parents. Uh, they are, instead, they are kind of, I would say, maybe imaginary from the society. They have to be in, in, in hospice, it's like in, in, 
assistance houses. And uh, so this was used to entertain them. But uh, Paro is also used, uh, and you will see this uh, uh, in, in a video, which I will be presenting in the end, to care some uh, forms of autism in children. Because uh, for, for children suffering from this kind of disease, uh, they have a sort of relational problem. And sometimes the therapists, they use uh, real pets, animal pets. But uh, a pet is fine. But actually, the robot pet, the neuroscientists have uh, uh, tested that it's even more reliable because it's not dangerous like an animal pet, which could be some kind of motion and, 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 and the child could be frightened. And also, through the machine, they can record the progress of the child in a kind of obje objective way. So one way or the other, you know, this by robotics is, 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 is taking as a, as a, you know, just more and more attention. So it's also about robots as tools for better understanding human neurophysiology and pathologies, and also to help the development of bionic and biomechatronic uh, components. And uh, of course, you know, these areas of medical, robotics, surgical, rehabilitation, and biorobotics, uh, they have really you know, the central core of the last part of the, of the handbook, because uh, the, last, the handbook is organized in seven parts, and the final part is about um, humans and robots, or if you wish, like uh, uh, um, life-inspired robotics. And uh, so, I mean, you can find, I, I, gave you, I gave you one chapter, which is on, on surgical robotics as a sort of supplementary reading to my lecture. But uh, of course, I cannot give you the, f the whole handbook for free. But if you go to the handbook website and just you scroll through the chapters, and if there's any kind of chapter you'd like to, to have, I can send you on a kind of confidential basis if, you, if you're not going to distribute, because of course it's kind of copyright infringement. So that's why, um, you know, just, just go to the handbook web website if you have any interest. I mean, there's a very nice chapter about rehabilitation robotics. There are more than one chapter on biorobotics, so you can get there. And also, as you saw in the video, uh, the handbook was uh, received a very prestigious award in, in February 2009 because it received the so-called Prose Award. The Prose Award is given annually by the American Association of Publishers to the best books published in several domains. And uh, so the handbook got the award for the, for the category of engineering and technology, but the sweetest surprise was to get the award for the general category of physical sciences and mathematics. And as I used to say, this was not an award for Springer, for the publisher, was not an award for myself, for Usama, not even for the 200 and more authors. I think this was an award to robotics, community and robotics as a science, beyond the boundaries of engineering technology. The book, the book which I got the award the year before was a book by Wiley, whose title was uh, Molecules and Medicine, just to give you the idea of, of the breadth of the field. And of course, you know, Springer was very happy because they never won, they never won, and they, since then they haven't won this, this, this award. So at Heidelberg and now in London, you know, we are quite popular because, you know, just they, they like us as a sort of, um, you know, their kind of golden uh, authors. So uh, let, let's go now into the, into the details of the lecture. And uh, let me start talking briefly about computer integrated sur surgery. So what I want to stress here, it's not you saw the Da Vinci as the robot used for, uh, for, mi for, mi for uh, kind of minimally invasive surgery, but it's not, the, it's not the robot itself. It's a whole system. So it's not quite correct to speak about robotic surgery actually is a CIS, is a computer integrated surgery in which the surgical robot is just one element of a larger system which is designed to assist surgeon in carrying out surgical procedure. So there are usually three phases in the operation with the surgical robot. One is the so-called preoperative phases in which we do, we do, I mean, I'm not a surgeon, but, uh, you know, but now I'm kind of, uh, uh, in a way, I'm very empathic uh, just because now working with the surgeon. So I've also assisted some, uh, to some of the, uh, of the robotic surgeries. So it's the computer assisted planning. And also in some cases, depending on the type of surgery, uh, there is a sort of trying to match the models which I use with, with the actual model of, of a patient. For instance, uh, in case of orthopedics, you know, there is a model of uh, if, uh, if there is a, a sort of uh, uh, like, uh, uh, you know, like uh, um, um, 
the, the nip replacement or in, in case of the tibia and, and the femur, I mean, just it's like you, you have a CAT model and you have to make sure that what's happening in the real operation is matching the computer data. Then there is intraoperative uh, uh, phase of CIS in which uh, the model and the plan are eventually uh, updated through a computer assisted execution and typically the surgeon operates behind a console and there's a number of data. What I want to stress here that uh, according to the uh, current state of technology, there is a visual perception, but there is no tactile perception. And this is one topic on which we are working. So the surgeon has uh, a very high definition view, also with the sense of immersion, it's a 3D view, but doesn't, uh, doesn't feel the consistency of the tissue of what's happening. So it's based on their experience, of course, you know, in open surgery. So this is one, one big topic of research. And then there is a computer assisted assessment, it's the post-operative phase. So, I mean, so this is part of, uh, of, 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 of this loop. And uh, let's look at uh, what are the pros and cons of humans versus robots. I think this is a very, very useful exercise to do together. This is like, um, so what could be strengths of a human surgeon uh, well, if the surgeon is good, is well trained, usually humans, they have a natural way to coordinate hand and eye movements kind of, uh, you know, inherently, sp spontaneously, and there's a strong hand-eye coordination. Also, a good surgeon is also, based on experience, a dexterous surgeon at human scale. It's flexible, adaptable, can take decisions during the surgery can integrate extensive and diverse information, also is able to use qualitative information that comes from consulting with other surgeons if they open as a team, if they operate as a team, good judgment, and also is a kind of easy to instruct the debrief because it's like humans, and sometimes this is less obvious for robots. What are strengths of the robots? Well, the main advantage is good, good geometric accuracy. For instance, the two kinds of operations which are in, in, in the hospital at Polyclinic, in, in, my, in my university, basically is the urologist doing prostatectomy and also some kind of um, uh, uh, other surgery of, of urologic or andrologic uh, uh, type. Then there are the gynecologists that they do basically hysterectomy and some general surgeons doing some kind of surgery for, uh, for uh, uh, colon, rec uh, rectus and, and things like this. So good geometric accuracy is important because, for instance, in prostatectomy, because of the high dimensional visual, there is no risk whatsoever to cut the nerves. And so, I mean, it's minimally invasive and it's, it's more precise. Stable and untiring, although don't forget, it's the surgeon to operate a console. So it's, because sometimes, you know, when, when once I was there, and especially in an hospital in Napoli where there is a lot of humanity, you know, some of the patients, it's a professor, it's not me, to, to my colleague, you will operate me, not, not, not the robot, no. <laughs> in the sense it's like, you know, this kind of misconcept uh, which could be, can be designed for a wide range of scales, maybe sterilized, so it's like uh, resistant to radiation and infection. That's another plus of having the robot arms instead of the human arm. Also because some, um, some of the big surgeons, they, they lost fingers because of the exposure to radiation. Because, you know, during the surgery there is also need to do to, to take uh, radiation. And I remember one of the famous orthopedic uh, in Napoli, uh, Eugenio Iannelli, the big names, big, big uh, f father of, uh, of, uh, of orth orthopedic surgery, uh, he, because of, you know, he had like three fingers in the hand because, you know, just because of radiation, exposure to radiation, uh, he, he, lost, he, lost, uh, he lost two fingers. Can use diverse sensors in control. What are the limitations of uh, humans versus robots? I mean, as I wrote, dexterous at human scale, but actually, outside the natural scale, is a limited dexterity. In fact, some, some of the surger, surgical operations of the rectus of the colon are made by robots because it's, it's, very, it's very hard to access. And if you don't have a camera, if you don't access, you know, it's, it, for, for, an open, for open surgery, it's, it's, it's really, you have a limited dexterity. It's prone to tremor and fatigue. I mean, just, uh, uh, if you want to be operated, like, uh, 
it's better to be the first one <laughs> in the day to be, <laughs> to, be, to, be, to, be, to be the last one. My wife had surgery last month, and uh, you know, I was sure that she was the first one. You know, <laughs> when it's like the surgeon is fresh. I mean, that's, that's, that's human. That's a human. You know, so limited geometric accuracy, large operating room space equipment, limited st 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 sterility, and also, as I said, you know, this is a, this is a, pros, uh, this is a pro, that's a con, susceptible to radiation infection for humans. And then for robots, limitation, poor judgment, you know, this kind of decisional ability to take a live decision during the surgery by humans is not by robots, of course. Limit dexterity and hand-eye coordination, because not for the technology, because the sensor themselves that robots use are even beyond the range of, 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 of the human sensors, but it's the intelligence, it's the fusion, it's the multi-sensor fusion which is still missing. In, in machines and in robots. Limited to relatively simple procedures, uh, although uh, at this, uh, uh, this uh, um, um, robotic surgery conference in Napoli, I met uh, one of, uh, it's not one, if you, if you Google, Pier Cristoforo Giulianotti. He is, uh, uh, he is the most known and, and successful surgeon a robotic surgeon, we can say, at uh, University of Illinois in Chicago. He's an Italian. He's one of the brains that Italy let emigrate because he was not given the, the chair in the Italian university system. So he's one of, since I, I mean, this is a, something which I'm very, you know, affectionate about. Uh, is one that, uh, you know, Italy l let him go. And he is now, he has, he has made more than 2,000 operations. By, uh, by robots, and I saw his keynote that I, he gave at this conference in Napoli, and I was really enchanted. He was able even to use uh, the Da Vinci system for uh, removal for a very delicate operation for pancreas cancer, which, which, is very, which, is, which is fatal. You know, people affected by pancreas cancer, they die in uh, one month, two months, and he was able to rescue one person. It's very complicated. So, I mean, so, I mean like, uh, the operation that I said, like uh, prostatectomy, hysterectomy, and this kind of uh, uh, colon, uh, it's almost kind of ordinary operations. I think the big challenge is to use this kind of system for more complex uh, surgeries, which are usually open surgery, and as such are kind of more dangerous and less accurate. So, I mean, I was really, and uh, I hope that uh, we can cooperate with him, and also there is uh, one of his uh, pupils who is a, a professor at University of Firenze, his name is uh, Marco Caratti, and also we are now cooperating with him because uh, I think you know they are really they are really very very well uh, experienced about uh, about uh, how to improve uh, over the current uh, status of uh, let's say dexterity and uh, reliability of the Da Vinci system. So we are we have started to talk with them. So uh, simple procedures, expensive. Because the Da Vinci robot in the US, it's $1 million. You know how much is in Italy? 3 million euro. Because Abbi Medica, which is the company representing intuitive, uh, you know, it's, it's unbelievable. And you can't buy directly. It's not you can go on, on, on Amazon.com and you can, you can buy directly from abroad, you know, at, at, at a sort of cheaper price. That's because of all the commissions and fees and things like this. So it's, it's still an expensive system. And also, in a way, it's difficult to construct the bug because, I mean, just it's like, it's obvious, it's not uh, like building a normal robot. So uh, what is the background to surgical robotics? Uh, the background actually goes back to the 80s in which there were a number of results. I mean, this kind of bottom-up approach, you know, I, I did my PhD in the, in the 80s, and in the 80s, the big things were mechanical design, kinematics, control algorithms, programming, which were mainly developed for industrial robots. And initially, before the Da Vinci system was built in 2000, was realized, basically, people were trying to adapt industrial robots, like white versions, in a clean room of industrial robots to do, eventually, robot-assisted surgery. So, Later, after the 80s, thanks also to the development of sensory technology and the possibility to react to changing conditions, these robots acquired more adaptability and autonomy. And this is why they started to be used in a sort of a surgical scenario. So what are the useful techniques for surgery? Well, of course, imaging is very important. So imaging process processing, spatial reasoning and planning, 
real-time sensing and control, and haptics, because as I say, the surgeon operates through an optical, which is not yet the case, because it's, it's, it's only visual. There is no tactile perception. So it's not a fully optical device, but soon it, it will be. So since I spoke about adapt adaptability and autonomy, I took this uh, picture from a very nice article that appeared recently on uh, science uh, robotics by the authors are authorities of, of the field. Uh, you have to realize that most of the technology go, which has gone into the Da Vinci comes from Johns Hopkins University. This is the group of uh, Russ Taylor and also is another guy, Greg Fisher, who is now uh, an associate professor of, um, of uh, surgical robotics at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. And again, life is a matter of choice because last November, I got a, tempting, a very tempting offer. I got an offer to move to near Boston to direct to be a chair of the Department of uh, uh, Bioengineering and Robotics at Worcester Polytechnic Institute uh, near Boston. But uh, again, uh, I was tempted, but I say, I mean, just, you know, I'm 57 now, well, 58 next month, and I mean, do I want to leave? I mean, I didn't leave at the time. You know, I'm so rooted to Italy and Napoli. So I hope you know, this could be also a good symptom that something may ha happen around May and I made the right, the right choice not to, <laughs> not to leave. <laughs> Just someone probably has understood what I really care about and what is my number one uh, interest <laughs> before robotics. So let's see if this kind of conjecture that I gave up this opportunity will turn into something. Okay, so levels of autonomy. Um, so here on this, on this graph, you can go from the open surgery, in which is the surgeon to operate, in which is no autonomy at all, to the case yet to come of full autonomy. And so here you see like you have some kind of robot assistant, you can have some kind of task semi-autonomy or autonomy, then you can have also a sort of conditional autonomy in which it's the robot to perform some procedure, but with close surgical oversight by human, then the high autonomy in which the robot is also given is endowed with the capability of uh, decisioning under the supervision of a qualified operator up to maybe in just, you know, some kind of operations like the simple ones will, can also become some sort of fully automated in which no human needs to be in the loop and the robot can perform an entire surgery. So if you go to, so I think it's the March issue, of, uh, of science robotics is a very nice survey article because I think, you know, if you want to enter in, into a field, um, I think it's nice, kind of survey articles are very useful, you know, to probe further into the uh, technical contents of one field. So, this is the scenario. Now, what is meant by MIS, minimally invasive procedures? Uh, typically, this became as a natural flow from laparoscopy. Laparoscopy was, uh, was a sort of surgery which is still operated by humans. There is no robot. And there is a, a kind of tool, which is a laparoscopic tool, in which the surgeon operates using this kind of tools, you know, it's kind of, if you wish, manually operated uh, arms and devices. So the, the advantage is that you reduce the number of uh, incisions, so it's less invasive than open surgery in which you have to open. And then, Basically, in laparoscopy, you use long handle instruments to grip and cut tissue, and typically, you have a video which provides a view of the operating field. The benefits are uh, you have a reduced discomfort, you have uh, also an improved cosmesis, because the cuts are less invasive and because, compared to, you, to uh, open surgery. And uh, more importantly, for the sanitary system, for the wealth system of a country, you cut down the, uh, the cost because you have a reduced time of uh, convalescences and also you, you've reduced the hospitalization costs. Like patients operated uh, by prostatectomy by the Da Vinci, they go home uh, at most 48 hours the operation, whereas before it was at least one week, you know, uh, with, with open surgery. Limitations on dexterity manipulation because uh, uh, it's typically, I mean, uh, for instance, we've been discussing with the surgeons what they want, what they expect of, of the end effect of the, and uh, I will touch this issue later. We are, with my PhD student, we are now, we have applied for a European patent for a new tool which I will be describing, but dexterity and the possibility also, uh, I didn't know until I became interested, 
I mean, one of the most difficult tasks for a surgeon is the suturing, is what is called the anastomosis. So it's after the cut, after the surgery, you have, you have to, to bring the two parts of the tissue and then you have to sew, like suture. And that's very difficult. And only a good surgeon is able to do, and suturing, if you do a bad, sur a bad suturing, could be, could be kind of, uh, you know, uh, not really lethal, but uh, uh, fatal for the patient, but can suffer some kind of infection, some kind, so it's very important. And that's where they need dexterity. So for instance, currently with the Da Vinci, they do the suturing like passing the, you know, the, 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 the string, like from, from one arm to the other, and they have to be trained to do a good, good suturing. So that's also very important, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a matter of dexterity. Also, there is a problem in doing this manually with the laparoscopic tool. It's like the mental transformation between visual and motor coordinate frames. I've been teaching robotics for too long. And what, I mean, the main concept of robotics, you, have to, you can describe robots and different objects by associating coordinate frames. And you have to relate the position and rotational transformation from one frame to the other. And this is very much the case for, of course, in the operating scenario for, uh, for, uh, uh, for a surgical for a surgical robot. Also, typical, typically there is no contact force perception and also friction might be quite uh, uh, strong and impairing a good, a good contact force perception and so typically there is no distributed tactile info available for, uh, for, for minimally invasive uh, procedures. Let's go one step further. Let's move from, from the use of a device, a manual device like a lap laparoscopic tool to robotic assistance. So we want to design devices with good dexterity and intuitive control that can be inserted through small incisions, like it was the case for laparoscopy. Also, we want to develop general purpose system that can execute a, a range of procedures. And typically, this is, uh, uh, in general, also has been used for thoracic. Uh, I think I forgot urological because I think it's both urological and gyne gynecological surgery. The ability to perform stable and untiring tasks like uh, endoscope pointing and organ retraction and also to work at microscopic scales. And I will come to this issue later when I will be speaking about uh, a, a new area of minimal invasive surgery, which is uh, uh, micro, microsurgery. I'll tell you later. So typically what happens is the surgeon operates behind a master controller. He has a monitor with a 3D ID vision and then uh, typically the surgeon imparts some position commands to the surgical robot, which is next to the patient, and uh, this is dashed because there is not yet force, force feedback. And then, of course, you have a video robot in which, I mean, like one of the arm is used as a camera. Uh, so typically it's, it's four arm, so three as tools and one as, as, as a camera, and then goes, you know, back, f feeding back the data to the monitor. So this is the typical scenario for uh, MIS. Now, as I say, imaging is very important. So I will spend a few slides to tell you what is behind the image-guided procedures. Of course, imaging techniques must be non-invasive, and this is the typical case of CT or uh, magnetic resonance, which has really improved you know, the diagnosis of pathologies, which also require surgery later, so in 3D, but also there are other kind of techniques. These are ultrasonography, fluoroscopy, conventional X-ray radiography, which is almost uh, overcome. As most of the information now is with, uh, with CT and, uh, and MRI, MRI, you know, just as ma 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 magnetic resonance in imaging. Precise location of pathologies. So uh, it's important because you want to spare cutting or removing the surrounding tissues so you can be very precise and only operate on the area that needs to be, uh, uh, to be removed or cut. Or, and this is the case of biopsy and resection of uh, brain tumors in which, I mean, like, uh, it's, it's, this is even more important because the brain has not yet fully understood. So like brain surgery and removing both uh, um, benignous and malignous sort of cancer is, 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 very, is very dangerous. And uh, at the end of the day, we, have this, we need solution of three central problems planning, registration, and navigation. And this is the case for all kind of uh, vision-based uh, operation. Let's go one, uh, one step further. Automated segmentation of image da data. We need uh, to achieve some statistical categorization 
Also, typically, as I said before, we have to deal with the match between the anatomical atlas and the real image data. Also, uh, we, 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 we typically, uh, and this is the case when we are applying some of the work that we did in, in the Rodiman uh, project, we need to develop some physiological approach. So we have to be able to model growth patterns and also to determine organ shape. And especially if we want to manipulate the form of organs, this is very, very important. And preciseness is crucial. So all these process image data, they go to the surgeon. And the surgeon must be able to perform an analysis of the patient-specific anatomy. And then the surgeon has to specify, to decide what is the treatment plan for this pathology. And of course, there are many different approaches depending on specific of organs involved and, and uh, last but not least, the treatment uh, methodology. Uh, according to the general framework of pre-operative, intra-operative, and post-operative scenarios, it, the pre-operating plan requires registration of image data with patient's at an anatomy. So, Typically, especially for certain surgeon, you do a scan of the patient and you have this data and those data are available during the surgery. And then you have so-called fiducial based approach in which uh, the, you use markers attached to the anatomical structure prior to imaging. So, I mean, this is used also in the cinematography, you know, just uh, like uh, to teach uh, machines and robots like with, with, with markers. And this also involves at the time and cost and sometimes not all the patients need to be kind of glued with this kind of mar uh, marker. So eventually this could be a significant discomfort to the patient. The robot, of course, that detects the markers, you know, through kind of some kind of optical probe, electromagnetic ultrasonic. I mean, there are several ways of detecting the markers. And then we, we also have shape-based approach in which uh, we use uh, intraoperative measurements. So during the operation, and typically this is the case of optical laser and video, to get some pre-operative image data. So once the operation starts, you, call, you can collect this data. I mean, the, usually the, 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 the patient is under anesthesia, and then you can collect this data. And the problem is, uh, which is also we are addressing now with the surgeon, because our goal, our dream is to give this kind of tactile haptic perception to the new system. Also, sometimes you have to correct the motion of patient deformation of tissue during surgery. And this is very, very difficult. And you can't, you can't do this yet with, uh, with the commercial, the clinical Da Vinci system. Uh, the preoperative plan and image data that we have collected then are used by navigation by either the robot or human surgeon, because this kind of imaging could also be used for open surgery by human surgery. It's not only for robot surgery. This is used no matter what, of course. And so the issues are cost, implementation difficulty, clinical acceptance, and safety concerns. If it's the robot manipulator to handle the, instru the instrument, then typically, as I said, you have to get absolute position and orientation of the patient and the image data related to the patient in some kind of fixed and coordinate frame. Because you must be sure that you operate you know, in, in, in the right frame. And this is when control comes into play, because thanks to control, the instrument motion is related to the patient's autonomy and the pre-surgical plan. If it's uh, the human surgeon to operate and to use this data, then that's use, those data are useful for a typical handheld movements by the instrument in which at most the surgeon takes advantage of some display of the images on the computer. That, that's, also, that's also possible. So, I mean, again, you know, if you look at image gu guided, as I said, we have planning, registration, and navigation. These are the three big issues with image-guided procedures. Now, let me start speaking about uh, the advances part of my lecture, because this is, you can find in all, uh, like in the chapter that I provide a supplementary reading, this now, from this slide on, I'm trying to go beyond. And uh, by going beyond, I want to speak about microsurgery as uh, opposed to minimally invasive surgery. And uh, these images are, this is the typical uh, tool of a trocar. Trocar is uh, the, uh, this, ki this kind of uh, arms that, uh, uh, you know, for, for medical, for surgical robots like Da Vinci. So this is intuitive surgical Da Vinci uh, um, 
and the factor, and this is a typical uh, gripper. So the scale is a five millimeter. So as I said, for a surgeon, we were speaking with, uh, for instance, uh, some surgeon doing uh, surgery of billiard ducts, billiard ducts in the um, fegato, billiard. Uh, I don't know, fegato is a liver. liver. Yes, yeah, for, for liver surgery. Yes, of course. Yeah, kidney is a pancreas. Yeah. So it's like uh, for for billiard, billiard ducts, and there. The problem is the size, and also the, the anastomosis is, is very, only, only, only the, the, the most skilled surgeon is able to do an anastomosis of billiard ducts with the Da Vinci system. So we started looking at the issue. So today, in our opinion, it's not only my opinion, no commercial robot is being specifically dedicated to microsurgical procedures. For instance, we are, we are in contact with a group of uh, maxillofacial uh, 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 plastic surgery in Romania. They are the top in, uh, in, uh, in, in Europe. And uh, they have, uh, for, for plastic surgery, uh, there's the reconstruction of the nerves is very delicate. And they want to use some kind of robotic technology to do this in the most accurate way. So with the current level of technology, it's difficult. Only the, only the, only Pier Giulianotti in, in, uh, in Chicago is able to do microsurgery with uh, a system which was originally designed for, for MIS, for minimal invasive, not for microsurgery. So we want to reduce this scale. And uh, the, why are these limitations? Lack of dedicated micro instruments, large size of robotic system, high cost of purchasing and usage, remote console from which surgeon operates without the feeling of touch. That's another limitation. So the use of robotics in microsurgery is a promising challenge to reduce, to, fil to filter the tremor, to scale the motion, to have an enhanced precision and dexterity in tight spaces. So let's see what is uh, the market offering. Actually, those are not system yet on the market. It's, it's more, I would say, the, the pre-market, because um, there have been a number of prototypes that have been created for research purposes or are under development. One is the so-called Nero arm robot, which was developed in Canada by the University of Calgary. Another second one is uh, RAMS, Robotic Assisted Microsurgery System, developed uh, at uh, JPL Caltech, which is um, in California, uh, near in, in Pasadena. Then there is a microsurgical robot by Microsur. This is another robot, which is, uh, and as you can see, this is quite different compared to the scale of the Da Vinci, of the Da Vinci arms. Then we have uh, the STAR, the Smart Tissue Autonomous Robot, developed by the Children's National Health System in the US, in which basically this is uh, the white version of a conventional industrial robot, plus some kind of uh, reduced size tools. And uh, recently, we got this cooperation with a company in Italy, actually. The company is called uh, uh, MMI micro, so it's um, medical micro instruments, and this is a startup of Scuola Sant'Anna in Pisa, and uh, the CEO is one of my former students. His name is Giuseppe Prisco, Napolitan, and uh, he worked 11 years at Intuitive Surgical in Sunnyvale in California. So he has acquired a lot of expertise, and he has been the developer of many of the patents by Intuitive Surgical. So it's one of the brains that came back, luckily, and came back to Italy. No, 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 no academic position because, I mean, I think we are, we are very bad at recruiting brains back because some of uh, the positions are given in a kind of a clientele way. Or it's like, if you know, like maybe just a, a son or daughter of some minister. I mean, this is Italy. And uh, so this guy came back. This guy came back and, uh, and he started this company and they have developed a system which is called Pico Robot. Uh, and they are trying now to certify this. So we have started cooperation with them. Actually, uh, we submitted one proposal to among this kind of 85 which didn't make it. But uh, I mean, now we have, uh, uh, we have submitted a proposal for uh, a joint PhD with them involving also University of Leeds 
where they're using some kind of new technology for imaging, and this technology is called terahertz. It's a typical, is a, is a new technology to have this kind of uh, high definition images. So we are cooperating, and because we want to invest some research efforts into into microsurgery, and this is the Pico flat platform that uh, they they've developed. Uh, at uh, they are in Calvi near Pisa. And he has a group of really talent, uh, young talents working in his, 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 it's a small company, it's a startup, of course, you know, it's like, uh, but uh, I'm, I, I, I predict that they will be success, successful. So let's try to widen the discussion and let's see why, I mean, it's not only the, the, uh, the surgery itself, but uh, actually when we, when we launched it, when we started the Icarus Center, in, in Napoli, I spoke with the rector and I said, look, you know, of course, he was able to get this big money to get to the Da Vinci clinical system. I said, no, no, wait. I think, you know, just if we want to start robotic surgery or surgical robotics, uh, as, as you like, you know, because of course, on the surgeon side is robotic surgery. You know, of course, I do research on surgical robotics because I'm the engineer, so I look at the robotic side. I think, you know, the, the Icarus Center is built on three pillars. One is the clinical. For, for the operation, you know, or for the real operation. The other one is the training, because, uh, of course, you know, the youngsters, uh, actually the youngsters do much better. You know, if one day I have to be operated by, with Da Vinci system, I will ask a young assistant professor more than a full professor, because, uh, I mean, uh, unfortunately, my second son, he doesn't like studying, but uh, by, if I look at his ability with the PlayStation and video games, I keep telling him that he, will, he could be a great surgeon, because he's kind of, you know, with this soft touch, I think we are, um, we belong to a different generation and I'm having a trouble with this kind of soft touch with a smartphone, a tablet or a tablet. So I, thi I think, no, this, this is changing, you know, just, and, uh, and uh, I mean, the, the haptical ability of the new generation is, uh, is really incre increasing. So training is important and it's not only important training, but also simulation is important to have models of, uh, I mean, it's maybe it's a kind of control bias perspective, but modeling is very important for simulation. So we want to be able to develop uh, application in surgical training and simulation in which we want to be able to have robots providing force feedback from computer models of instrument tissue interaction, like a haptic interface. And there are some developed systems which already exist uh, for some kind of surgery. Uh, Typical surgery is the arthroscopic knee surgery in which we, we use model, we use simulation. Tubal anastomosis is also another kind of system in which, which takes advantage from training and simulation and of course laparoscopic surgery. What are the advantages? Reduce the training costs because you can, you can have the people be trained more quickly. Trainees can review their data to analyze the technique and how well or how bad they perform you know, in, 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 in being trained. The trainers can evaluate the progress of the trainees and, and the skill level, and surgeons can explore new surgical techniques by incorporating preoperative image data, those I spoke about earlier, also with patient-specific procedures which can be rehearsed and improved over, over the time. Why do we have limitations in robotic surgery? I think it's important to address this. And why we have a considerable room for what I call another design of surgical robots. Uh, right now, for instance, uh, um, the Da Vinci system has uh, four basic motion. When, when I was speaking with surgeons, sometimes you know, they have this kind of difficult time in the suturing because they, have, they, they would like to have uh, additional degrees of freedom because the human arm is redundant and we have uh, many more degrees of freedom that we strictly need to really identify the pose of an object. So we want to have improved chimeric configuration and redundancy because redundancy is a synonym of dexterity. But then you have to know how to handle and how to control redundancy. More compact and efficient actuators and transmission because that's a sort of bottleneck because uh, sometimes you know, they are too big, especially when we want to develop a system for microsurgery. Sensorized laparoscopic tools using identified models of biological tissues and this goes back to the need of models, ability to use information from disparate sensors, as the humans can do with our beautiful ability of sensor fusion, to control the behavior during the course of procedure, and also, last but not least, easy programming and debugging. So, I will conclude the lecture by telling you what we have been doing in, in our Icarus Center, so ongoing research activities. I'm not saying, I mean, these are only some. I mean, the, the field is, is, really, is really broad. So these are something that uh, 
caught our attention. So there are five or six uh, research topics. The first one is a direct fallout of the Rodiman project, in which uh, in the Rodiman we developed uh, a technique in which uh, we can recognize in real time at 40 frames per second a deformable object like a pizza flying. We are using silicon disks. You will see some also in, in the final video, general video, which I will present. So we do this and we, we use this, uh, we, 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 we're doing this kind of imaging, recognition and tracking with the conventional Kinect sensor. Kinect is a very low cost sensor. You can find video, 100 euro in the video games and it's been used as a, it's a camera in infrared basically. So we want to use advanced tools for medical image analysis and image guided assisted surgeries. What are the research issues? The object extraction of 3D deformed bodies to measure and visualize 3D anatomical structures and delineate regions of interest. And this comes from the expertise with the, with the pizza tossing. And also, we, we, we're able to do this uh, in real time, so we can use the data for a co-registration, segmentation, and tracking in real time. So that's, uh, I think, something which can improve. The second topic of research is uh, the possibility of developing to enhance the capability of the surgeon operating behind the console, we could have maybe eye tracking, in which the, it's the surgeon, you know, and the technology already exists to do this. So it's a sort of, to improve the ergonomy. So to want, we want to endow the surgeon with extra abilities, integrating the same control console. So it's not only the visual perception, but also the tactile perception. You can also have a microphone for speech recognition and also for force B feedback, I mean, it's not easy to interpret how much is the value of the force. So we're thinking about a sort of colorimetric scale, you know, with according to the color, tells you the amount. I mean, doesn't, you don't need to know ac accurately how much force, but you can see whether it's yellow, orange, red, blue, g green, and so forth, you know, just what, what is the, the amount of uh, a sort of colorimetric scale for force feedback. And also, we want to be able to have a sort of customized rendering supporting you know, the operation. So you, the, ideally, we want the surgeon to have a sort of overlap, super, superimposition of the customized images to the 3D rendering of, of, of the scene. And that's why you need models of the organ. And uh, yeah, as I said, uh, uh, to have force and visual feedback in a sort of visual augmented reality environment. So we are working in that direction. Another one is uh, more general related to the possibility of controlling the, the whole automatic task. So, you know, and this is specifically thought for uh, suturing, or if you wish to call it anastomosis, uh, like autonomous or semi-autonomous, in which uh, we want to be able, assuming that we can have both vision and force, we want to have developed te tracking <laughs> techniques for vision-based tissue and for sensing, object density re re reconstruction, pattern recognition for needle tracking and optimal trajectory planning. So this graph uh, just depicts what is our idea. You know, so this is the original scene. This is the segmented image of the scene. Then you overlap, you superimpose with the model and that's some kind of frame business. And then you can estimate exactly what is the pose of the, of, the, of the organ, what you have to do. So this is just improving the control ability for semi-autonomous tasks. Also, we're working on the sensing aspects because in the Icarus Center, it's not only the, uh, the control people in engineering, but also there are the people working in electronics, in optoelectronics. So in this case, we have this uh, joint venture with some colleagues developing some optical sensor based on fiber bragg grating. And we have done some preliminary tests. Actually, there will be, uh, there will be a paper which will be presented in two weeks at IROS conference uh, uh, in, in Vancouver in which we present the first results on this. And a, again, you know, the, the, big, the big challenge, we want to ha use this sensor because uh, we want to be able to, to have a real haptic feedback at the surgeon console. And it's not only uh, optoelectronic, but because also we are speaking with the, with the, with the, with the physicists 
not only with the experts of optoelectronics, because we can use also a different kind of, of, of sensors like organic materials. Uh, this is uh, probably, uh, Maria Carmela knows, Antonio Cassinese is a physicist uh, who is also active uh, in our department and also he works with another guy at uh, the Spin Center at the CNR. His name is Luigi Barra. Uh, and so we're, we're, we're talking with them about how to uh, use different kind of uh, sensing technology for uh, haptic feedback ultimately. Uh, this is something which uh, you should treat confidentially because this, is, uh, this video illustrates the patent because we discovered that the, um, the tool, I mean, the arms of the Da Vinci have only four degrees of freedom, but there is an allotment for a fifth degree of freedom. So my PhD student has developed, uh, you can see here, this additional degree of freedom, and we have submitted a European patent on this. Uh, so, I mean, this is something, something new. So we want to increase the dexterity, and also we want to improve, ultimately, the surgeon's sensory motor skills. So we have uh, the possibility, thanks to this additional degree of freedom, to, uh, to have a reorientation of the needle, and so we can reduce the re-grasping operation if you do this kind of B-manual uh, su uh, suturing. So that's, uh, and the dream would be also to, to move from this kind of, uh, kind of uh, uh, if you wish, like uh, a finite dimensional system with a certain number, of ma uh, certain number of parameters, degree of freedom, to a sort of continuous robot. I mean, so we're speaking about a sort of snake-like end effector, but this is very, you know, it's some kind of brainstorming that we did. And this is the, uh, the project uh, whose PI is uh, funny, my postdoc, Musha, which is about this uh, uh, three degree of freedom mini hand, which Da Vinci doesn't have yet. So she, she is uh, working uh, on the design of this, and there will be, uh, we, 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 will, we will print a prototype with our semi-professional 3D printer, and then we will, thanks to the open platform, we can test this on the Da Vinci platform that we have uh, in the kit, in, in, in the lab of, uh, at the center of Icarus. Uh, I think this is the last, the last one for ongoing research activities. It's like open source engines for surgery realistic simulation, in which, for instance, here, this is also some of the uh, work related to, to Rodiman. Here, we want to have a sort of uh, realistic simulation of surgical, uh, scenario. This is useful for training, of course, but also for designing new strategies for autonomous control of particular tasks like uh, robotic uh, uh, surgery. So again, we want to have a real-time reconstruction of the environment and the possibility of tracking and modeling of uh, the formal object, including also uh, friction. And also, we want to have a, a system which can, uh, can have a realistic model of the collisions between a soft body say the formal or organ and the rigid body like the spatula of, of this case. So this is something that uh, we're currently working on. Other research activities that uh, we plan to develop, also with the involvement of other people and other skills into the uh, research uh, timeline of Icaros, is also with speaking with uh, people from computer science, I mean like uh, uh, it's undoubtful that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, like machine learning, like big data, deep learning, and com computing, com computing could also be beneficial to the general health care and then to the surgical field. Form methods for modeling medical guidelines for robotic surgery, haptic interfaces, also actually we, we are we're moving in that direction, and also to have a full virtual reality simulator of the Da Vinci for training in robotic gynecological surgery, because this has been demanded by our colleagues uh, in, in, in gynecology, that they, they really want uh, you know, to have a, 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 a real feasible reality uh, simulator for, uh, for training the, uh, you know, the, the young doctors, the young surgeons. What are the challenges, uh, just going towards the end of the lecture? Technical issues concerned with mechanical design, uh, the problem is that, uh, you know, the Da Vinci is, is, is a kind of compliant enough, but the tendency is still to have a, a sort of highly geared stiff arms, like the way in the industry. I think also for safety reasons, we need to be able to, to develop a system and, and robot arms which, are, which, have less compli which have more compliance, they're less stiff, and, and then you know, just extending the, the, the concept from the static case to the dynamic case, it's not only the compliance, the stiffness, but it's the whole impedance. Impedance means in mechanics, mass, damping, and stiffness, of course. Improved sterility and compatibility with the imaging system, this is something like sensing and control, 
and the big, the big challenge is to develop haptic interface, improved image-guided procedures. As I mentioned, this terahertz technology looks very promising by our colleagues in the University of Leeds in UK. Good hand-eye coordination and tactile sensing required for autonomous manipulation of soft tissue, and also the possibility of using uh, big data of anatomy and, and, and surgical cases to do some sort like humans are able to do some kind of qualitative reasoning and wide sensor integration and control, which are ultimately required one day for complete uh, autonomy. On the clinical side, there are a number of implementation and acceptance issues which are equally important, and we have this kind of dialogue with the users of, with the end users of this technology, because uh, that's why, for instance, uh, the problem of uh, certification of the new devices is, is, is not an easy one, because regulatory agencies require that, uh, it, that it be addressed for every clinical implementation, and that's very tough, and US is leading the way with the FDA, with the Food Drug Administration certification. There is no accepted technique that can guarantee safety in every circumstance, and the common technique is typically the interposition of some sort of uh, passive, uh, passive devices, but as a control experts, of course, passive device is a big help, but the idea is to combine the passive safety, you know, with this kind of devices with active safety, safety mechanism in design of manipulators. And this is a problem which is uh, not of concern for surgical robotics, but for all robotic systems, you know, because, uh, I mean, if you take the KUKA lightweight arm, and then you see, probably you saw some video, also you will see later in which it's impacting the human, but you can, this is not sold. To be, to be completely safe, you know, because still, you know, just you, you, you can cause some, some damage. And also some robotics developers are, so it's important to keep control procedures in the hands of a surgeon. So it's going back to that graph in which I was speaking autonomy. People are not believing to go very extreme to the right of full autonomy. I think the surgeon, uh, they think the surgeon should always have some sort of uh, control of the whole procedure. Other acceptance issues which are important, is patient outcome improved, is cost likely to decrease, and for, for, for a national uh, um, you know, health system this is of concern. And also, as you realize, and what we're trying to achieve, our mission into the center, is that uh, if we want to develop groundbreaking systems, I mean, that's the result of teamwork. You know, it's not us, the roboticists, it's not the surgeon, but it's a continuous dialogue on robotic researchers, computer scientists, and, uh, and surgeons. So, well, let me close before I go to the final part with a couple of uh, cartoons. When I say that, you know, just sometimes the patient is concerned whether it's the robot to operate. And since, you know, my biggest uh, area of research is about uh, microsurgery, there's, there's a funny one there. <laughs> okay, now I will spend the final, let's say, 20 minutes, if I'm allowed to, just, uh, I mean, as you realize, surgical robotics uh, is, uh, is one field of advanced application of robotics, and this actually relates uh, to a sort of flow. So is, uh, ideally, robots have been moving out of the factories to go to our, I say, our homes, because the hospital is a sort of social environment, so by extrapolation is a sort of home, because it's our daily life. So in this kind of uh, flow from industry, to the field and to the service, the four here are the four fields of applications which are most developed on a commercial side. So, for instance, when we speak about industrial robots, the four fields of application, these are the data which are published annually by the World Robotics, some, uh, the, uh, the World Robotics, uh, World Robotics is an uh, is annual report by International Federation of, of Robotics, Automotive, Chemical, Electronics and Food. Field is aerial, space, underwater, search and rescue. Service is uh, domestic, edutainment, which is uh, education with entertainment, rehabilitation and medical. So what is the, the increasing level of autonomy if I move from the left to the, to the right? And if, if we look at some kind of uh, data for the markets, I try to visualize what has happened in our field with, uh, in the last, uh, let's say, 50 years and projecting towards the next 10 years, the next decade. I mean, we had the analog wave, we have the digital revolution with the first digital wave of PCs and the second digital wave 
of our digital consumers and network, we can't live without them. And then, you know, just prediction is that uh, following this, there will be robotics wave. And if, if we look back at this study, which was commissioned in 2005 to the Japanese uh, Robotic Association, this is very much fitting the data which were published recently by McKinsey. Uh, I mean, this also is a, is a big topic which deserves probably another lecture because uh, if you go to the World Robotics Forum in Davos, this, this statement by 10 years, 5 million jobs will be lost because of robots. That's totally, you know, pedagog it's, it's, it's a sort of, um, uh, uh, this, this is pure dem dem demagogy because it's not true because, I mean, the robotics technology will create new jobs and, and, and new profiles as was the case also for, for computers and for other types of uh, this kind of uh, um, uh, disruptive technologies. But if we look at the data of uh, which this, this was done in 2005, so it's 10 years even more older than 10 years, I mean, two thirds of the markets in, in, in less than 10 years from now will be covered by personal service robots. Of course, manufacturing, which is the blue, is still a big market, but uh, the new fields are home, medical welfare, public sector, and bioindustrial. And even a big companies like KUKA, now they have an interest in medical robotics. I'm not speaking only about the big companies like this uh, MMI. I mean, even, even the big players, they are concerned with this. Of course, you know, uh, just uh, Google is Google, and Google has invited the market, and there's also some capital in China. There's a lot of uh, things are undergoing, so it's not, uh, you know, it's not predictable what will happen. Uh, also, I'm trying to link up to the topics of, uh, of uh, surgery of robotics and, as I said, uh, biorobotics. Just, uh, I'm trying to do an exercise with you and to show, in just in one graph, how this sort of marriage, this kind of the confluence between biology and robotics has producted uh, some, uh, some visible results into the scientific community at large. And I'm doing this with a citation by the most translated uh, Italian journalist into English, Italo Calvino, who is a, a well-known journalist, uh, speaking about that, but one way or the other, our imagination is influenced when we speak about uh, a robot, an avatar, a, a kind of a replica, uh, like uh, uh, we always think about having a sort of anthropomorphic uh, shape. And so in this sort of marriage, you know, roboticists have benefited from the dialogue with the biologists, with the experts in biomechanics, in neuroscience and psychology, because we can gain more knowledge of the living beings. At the same time, we are providing models of, with mechanics, control and sensors, thanks to which the theoreticians, you know, the people in biomechanics, neuroscience and psychology, they can, can validate the veridicity and the, uh, and the reliability of their hypotheses and models. And thanks to this kind of, of uh, merge, we have results into humanoids, into zoomorphic in processes, cyborg, even micro nano. So, I mean, biological inspiration, I think, is very important. Looking beyond, what are the research challenges in our field? This is, by no way, an exhaustive list of topics which I think are important. But I think, you know, this is reflecting very much what is boiling in the pot of uh, robotics at large, as I used to say. And uh, biomechanics, haptics, neurosciences, uh, machine learning, virtual prototyping, animation, surgery, and sensor networks. I think there, those are eight areas of research where we will have uh, some kind of uh, maybe most of the groundbreaking results in the next 10 years. And uh, since I mentioned my fifth child uh, next month, we will have an important uh, symposium, which originally was scheduled to be in London, but for uh, some kind of budgetary reasons. I mean, it's not related to Brexit, of course, uh, but uh, it will be in Heidelberg, which is the other uh, you know, uh, site of, of Springer Nature. And this will be invitation-based only, but I can provide uh, the link in due course if uh, some of you will, will remind me, because there will be a final panel. So the, there is a group of scientists, 20 invited scientists from all over the world, also with Sir Phil Campbell, who is the editor-in-chief of Nature, which I had the pleasure to meet a couple of times, and is, is really an inspired scientist, a, a wonderful person, and also with a professional journalist from, uh, from, 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 from Nature, and the idea is to have uh, this kind of uh, 
like uh, summit of two and a half days with these experts discussing in four breakout groups, one on knowledge, another one on design, third one on interaction, and the fourth one of impact. This is coordinated by Usama Khatib and myself. And the, uh, the idea is to provide a sort of white document, and this will be published next year as a, a nature outlook. Outlook is a supplement of nature. It will be distributed widely to the world. So this is, will be this nature out outlook devoted to life and robotics. And uh, the fifth child, which I'm trying to incubate, you know, just we, since because of the white interest of robotics, uh, the idea is to maybe in two years from now, I mean, this is still, to, of course, you know, it's sort of dream, you know, but to start uh, a new publications like Nature Robotics. And this would be, I think, the final consecration of robotics as a science across all the boundaries of, uh, of, uh, of science. You know, it's not only engineering technology. Of course, you had uh, Fiorella, who is uh, one of the, uh, you know, uh, big carriers of the roboetics flag. And that's very important because, uh, uh, I mean, and there was also recently this letter, which was signed by the CEOs of, uh, of AI and robotics company. Actually, Guglielmo Tamburini and myself, we were among the signees of the original petition after the World Congress of Artificial Intelligence in Buenos Aires, uh, October 2015. Now, even the people from industry, they have subscribed to this. I think it's important, of course, about the proper use of technology and avoid that these could be used as weapons or, you know, just uh, so robotics is, uh, it should be at the service of the benefit of the humanity. So this is the, you know, one, one message which I very much share, of course. And whether we will have uh, really robotics technology as a disappearing technology, you know, we don't pay everybody, each of us, including myself, have a smartphone or a tablet, and, you know, we take it for granted, but one day in our, in our environment, there will be some sort of distributed, distributed technology which will be so embedded into smart environments and thinking things, just like computers, which have become more and more per pervasive. So that's the big challenge is whether robotics will become an ubiquitous technology or not. Can I have the lights off for the final video? Because it's, uh, I think it's a cynic one. Uh, probably you have seen this, so because I mean, this is on the, on, on the web, but for those of you, so I'm going, I'm taking you just to conclude on a journey. What, what we call is the journey of robotics. Uh, in uh, 2000, when ICRA was uh, organized by uh, the people in San Francisco, ICRA 2000, Usama Khatib, uh, in Napolitan, I used to say Fratama, it's like my brother, <laughs> in, in all senses, because uh, it's like mon cher frère. Uh, Usama did a very nice video uh, about uh, the 50, robotics 50-year uh, journey in which uh, he was summarizing what happened between 1950 and 2000, the first 50 years. So when we worked on second edition of the handbook, together with Usama and Thorsten Kruger, we, we prepared this video for the community, and this is Robots, the Journey Continues. And this is really summarizing what has happened in our field in the last 15 years.
uh, the final message I'm leaving uh, um, with you, you know, just to reflect, I mean, surgical robotics is uh, one of uh, the image of uh, this kind of tassel mosaic uh, picture, but uh, I think you've been probably convinced that uh, uh, robots are with us, within us, and among us, much more than we are conscious, much more than, than, than we realize. 